Welcome to the Mobility Innovators Podcast. Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to welcome all listeners from around the world to the Mobility Innovators Podcast. I'm your host, Jaspal Singh. Mobility Innovator Podcast invite key innovators in the transportation and logistics sector to share their thought about the key changes in the sector, about their work, and what is their forecast for the future. Today, I'll be speaking with an amazing innovator. He is the Chief Technology and Innovation Officer at EMT Madrid. He's in charge of rolling out EMT innovative solutions like Smart Bus Madrid and pushing the mass deployment in the Madrid. He has a long lasting career in innovative digital product in the private and public sector. Prior to joining EMT Madrid, he was the VP for Strategy and Growth at SEAM, an IoT provider for Smart City. He was also the Chief of Staff of the Spanish Secretary of State for Telecommunication and Information Society, leading the definition and rollout of digital agenda for Spain. I'm so happy to welcome my good friend, Juan Coro, Chief Technology and Innovation Officer, EMT Madrid. It's now time to listen and learn. Hello, Kwan. Thank you so much for joining us. It's wonderful to have you on the show to share your experience with the listener. Oh, very nice to see you and be with all your friends at Kier Mobility Innovators. Thank you so much. So today I'll be spending time to learn more about you, your profession journey, the transit project you're working on, and your perspective on digitalization and innovation. And to start with, I would like to ask you to share a little more about yourself with our listener. Also, are there any interesting facts about your career that are not on the LinkedIn? Well, the most important parts are uh, away from the light in your life. So, uh, you never say when were your first kiss uh, <laughs> or <laughs> what did she said <laughs> at the first sight. Yeah. So uh, there are things in, in my LinkedIn which are not there, which is probably related to my political uh, um, vocation or aspirations and my political career, which has always been back and forth in my life, uh, and which all started at the very uh, uh, t- early time in the university when I joined the, the, the debate club in the university, uh, I like to discuss and to uh, and to debate. Uh, so I joined the, the the team from the university, and we were the first public university who won the national championship, the national mm-hmm. debate championship. Great. And uh, after that, we went to the international championship in Spanish. It was in Latin America, uh, and we were the first university winning the international championship of debate. Uh, so uh, that would be one of, of my top picks related to my background. And from then I was, uh, I, I, I presented myself uh, as a candidate. I was selected uh, as the president of the student union at the university. And those things moves <laughs> in the future. That's, that's great. Good to see that you are always, from the college itself, you are taking a leadership role, which you are doing right now at, at EMT as well uh, in the technologies. Well, one uh, at the very end, one realize some somehow someday uh, what you are somehow good at, uh, and and what what you uh, what you feel yourself meaningful when you do something, uh, and I find myself meaningful when I can serve to the common, to, to my neighborhoods, to my community, and that's where I find myself in a better shape. Uh, that's why I'm not very good at money. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. You are, you are good at connecting people. You are good at connecting uh, and serving people, and actually that's part of my second question. Uh, you partly answered it, but I would like to know more. Uh, you have more than 15 years of credit experience now, and you started your career in telecommunication industry with RGR Technology. But later you become a chief of staff to the Spanish Secretary of State for Telecommunication and Information Society. So I'm curious to know, why did you move to transit? You partly mentioned you want to serve people, so it's the answer, but I am very curious to know why you moved to transit. Oh. And how do you think your experience in public and private sector is helping you in the transit space? Well, I would say uh, it is very well linked. Uh, the, the whole story, to make the long story short, the captain of that debate team was appointed chief of the staff, uh, uh, deputy chief of the staff of the 
uh, uh, Spanish president of the Conservative Party, Mariano Rajoy, which was oh. at the very end prime minister, uh, well, president in Spain, but uh, compared it would be prime minister. So he was appointed deputy chief of staff and, see, and he asked me to join the cabinet uh, for four months in a very specific period. So I jumped to, to Madrid for those four months. I was working in my hometown of Santander. Uh, so I, I get to know the, the really uh, deep part of the political party. And when the government came, as I am a telecommunication engineer, they wanted me to join. And so they found this mixed place, which is similar to my place now, which is uh, mainly technical, with, but with some flavor of political vision or, or capabilities. And that's how I became chief of staff uh, at the Secretary of State, which was a very technical uh, position, but with Amen. some uh, political flavor. And that was the story. And why transit? Why transit? Uh, because the mayor asked me to do that. Uh, I, 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 was, I was talking to the mayor uh, from Madrid and, and they wanted to hire uh, and to bring people with digital skills uh, in, the, in the project. Uh, so I thought I was about to be in the digital office. Uh, he, he, he just launched uh, and he told me, yes, but I have more need on the transit. So I end here because of that. I, I was good at public sector. It's something I, I, I have a lot of experience and I find myself uh, um, fluent in this, in, this, in this type of environment. Uh, and I'm good at digital uh, projects and skills, but I knew very little about transport, transit or mobility. And two years afterwards, I, I think I, I can uh, assure that this is a fantastic time to be in mobility because oh, yes. everything is happening right now, right here. Yeah, I would say the right place, right time. And the uh, mayor did the right uh, pick for picking somebody who understand technology and uh, put them into transit because that's what transit need now. More technology, more innovation, more digitalization. Yeah, well, let's see when it ends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, I would say it will be a long journey and it will go upward and uh, higher. So now I would like to start our conversation with future of mobility in Europe. Uh, you are a member of European Commission Multimodal Passenger Mobility Forum, alongside 70 executives from all major transit operators. I would like to know more about your role on the committee. And also, technology can help to shape future of mobility by better responding to customer experience and expectation. How do you think technology and innovation will reshape the European mobility sector and Europe's mobility future in the next five years? And what are the some key changes we may see in the next five years? Well, uh, uh, framing out, okay? This is, <laughs> this is quite, <laughs> quite huge question you just ask in a few words. And now we have a thesis, a PhD to be, <laughs> provided to reply, but uh, uh, think about what are the two major trends that Europe is fostering right now? You would say the European uh, Green Deal, digital Green yeah. Deal is top of the list. So we are living in a sustainable green revolution on top of a digital revolution. And if you put all together in the very center is mobility. Yeah, because this is specifically related to the electrification and reduce the carbon footprint for the whole system um, and enhance in everything we have with digital capabilities and opportunities to deliver better service, more efficient to longer uh, wide base of users. And that's what it's all about. So from that perspective is how technology will shape the future. Uh, it's because with digital technologies, we can have some uh, special things we could not make before. For example, mm. uh, multimodal journeys uh, in big cities yeah. is a tough issue. You cannot deliver multimodal, uh, multimodal journeys easily uh, with you, when you have free floating services, bike sharing, motor sharing, car sharing, bike yeah. sharing, e-scooters, uh, <laughs> with re, uh, mass transit operators like Metro, Underground, or even our buses. We have more than 200 lines with more than uh, yeah. 3,000 stops. You cannot manage that complexity. And what digital tools allow, they enhance and enable to reduce complexity for every single user. 
And that's something digital technology is able to provide, is to provide your specific need satisfaction for every single user to enable multimodal yeah. trips. And that's the magic tool we have to deliver more mobility to more people in a wider sense. Well, that's a great point you mentioned about we have so many modes and it's only the technology which can be a connector for all these modes. And we have to make more and more journey personal. You can't just say, this is one offer, take it or leave it, but you have to cater to the personal need of people serving from point A to point B. Yeah, it's reduced complexity. Uh, and that's where digital tools, uh, if you start learning about complexity uh, uh, as a science, uh, uh, sometimes to reduce complexity, you have to um, add complexity to the system. Think about on the internet, you have yeah. hundreds and millions of web pages uh, and, and you cannot manage where it is, how to find, where is the right information. Yeah. And suddenly you add one more piece which is called search, uh, <laughs> uh, which is could be Google, Bing, or whatever search engine. And with more complexity brought by one more web page, you are able to handle the whole internet. So we need those reduced complexity, how it would be uh, complexity reducer tools, thanks to digital. Yeah, that's a great point. You add like adding one more layer uh, to solve all other complexity under it. Yeah, to, to let people manage the complexity, but you don't reduce complexity, you make it more handy. Handy for people to manage it. That's a great point. Uh, you actually mentioned about the European Green Deal and uh, Madrid is one of the key players and Madrid has committed to achieving carbon and climate neutrality by 2015 and launch a new sustainable strategy for the city called Madrid 360 in September 2019. And the goal is to reduce the uh, capital polluting emission and transform the city into the sustainable city. So I'm curious to know uh, how EMT Madrid will play a key role to achieve that goal, because you mentioned about that the sustainable mobility is a key component of the strategy. You cannot talk about Green Deal without talking about the clean mobility and uh, how technology and innovation concept uh, will help to achieve the mission of Madrid 360. Well, we are living a uh, humongous re revolution in mobility here in Madrid. And Madrid 360, which is the framework for the city, has uh, uh, everything to do with us and EMT Madrid. Uh, just to, to, to give you some figures, uh, in the next four years, EMT Madrid, we are investing 1,000 million euro only in electrification on the fleet. Mm. So bringing the fleet to electricity and building the infrastructure which are need to provide such a service is a, uh, a marvelous, immense. There is the, the largest investment ever um, we made in, in EMT. So we, let's say we have 1000 points in rolls, which are millions of euros we are investing. Yeah, that's, that's uh, a great point. Uh, and farther than that, we are bringing mobility, reducing or making the complexity handy with more information to the users, thanks to the services we are providing to everyone, uh, like uh, information about the um, estimated time of arrival for every single bus, the occupancy level of hours every single bus, and delivering that through our APIs, open APIs in mobility labs which is our uh, developers uh, portal but also through our application like mobility madrid mobility 360 which is our mobility as a service application yeah. uh, which is one of our uh, top uh, uh, bet for for this uh, but we are trying to solve um, the problem using all the tools we have at hand so we are trying all the mobility bring in all the opportunities and modes and see how can we figure out the recipe for the future now all all these are very great point you mentioned and we will be discussing some of them in detail uh, in subsequent question about the mobility as a service and uh, the technology platform you are building and working with uh, other companies to solve these challenges I'm also curious to know uh, the transportation system in Madrid. In Madrid, uh, the CRTM, which is the Public Transport Authority of Madrid region, is managing all public uh, and passenger transport services. And EMT primarily operate city buses. You also operate cable cars, bike sharing, parking system in the city, which is unique. 
uh, whereas Metro and, Metro... And, and a less popular services, which is the toll truck. Toll truck, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> less popular, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> because people people feel that it's in the back end and you don't want to call them. Uh, it's You call them only when you're in trouble. And uh, and Metro Madrid, you know, which is a big player, manage the Metro system and you have a Metro Ligaro, which is managing the light rail system. So Metro is different from other European city because you have different player operating different system. So I want to understand what are the challenges faced by an operator, especially the bus operator, because in many city, the bus operator doesn't get that kind of a priority or importance in the in the mobility hierarchy. Uh, how do you integrate your system with other agencies? For example, ticketing, service planning, passenger information system. What kind of challenges you face there? Well, the challenges and the opportunities are the two sides of the same coin. So we have the opportunity to bring the public transport authority, which is the consortium, uh, the CRTM, uh, in in the 80s. The, so so that was an amazing success from the Madrid region. So we put all under the same umbrella. So the consortium, the uh, public transport authority, is delivering all the ticketing uh, integration and enabling the information sharing scheme. So regarding to those specific points, ticketing, uh, an integrated ticket with the same car, you can travel all around in all the modes. In the in the in the, in the transit modes, you can travel with a with, with the red card we have for for the transport it, that, that is ruled and managed by the consortium. Uh, so that and they enforce us uh, with all the information requirements to provide the same information to the same authority. Uh, so that's something we got from granted of we 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 got that from the consortium where. The, the Madrid Town Hall is uh, vice president of the consortium. So okay. we are a, a, a big part of the, of, the, of the scheme. So we feel the consortium not be that away. What are our problems is that that is not a monolithic model. If you look at uh, London, for example, or other places where you have a strong uh, public body, Transfer for London, uh, Ile de France Mobilité or, or, or others, you have yeah. a big one player which have everything uh, under under them, and they can rule. So uh, those systems are all integrated, but had a problem about dynamism. Mm. So what we have is a more, let's say, controversial uh, system where we are always trying to innovate. Metro is always <laughs> trying to innovate. The public authority is saying you have to go like that. You have to go like that. <laughs> uh, but at the very end, it's more dynamic we, because we are all competing, trying to be the best. Yeah. So the, 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 the challenges are trying to do all you can, competing with other players in, in Madrid, trying to deliver at the very end the best service. So I'm happy about the current system. Uh, uh, and the monolithic system tends to be slower, less dynamic, or you could even say lazy. Yeah. Like if you have monopoly, then the innovation stop. Uh, and when you have to compete, then the innovation really happen. And you're right. Like when you need to compete with other player and show what you're doing best from other. Yes. And that's, a, that, that's the Madrid best, uh, I think, ingredient for, for the success recipe we are building in mobility to have everything integrated with several pieces, which are still competing and, and trying to, to be the, the best somehow. Yeah. Now, I feel MT Madrid will be one of the best player uh, in the <laughs> in the city because we yeah. are competing <laughs> so we go to the gym every <laughs> every month which is which is good <laughs> you stay fit <laughs> yeah that's it so my next question is about which a lot of people dislike discussing it's about pandemic and especially when you are a technology and innovation officer in a big public transport company when the lockdown began there was suddenly high demand to implement it project in a short period of time you must have had a similar experience, I can imagine. Now, hopefully we are kind of at the end of a tunnel. We are seeing things are settling down, things are opening up. So I can ask you this question, like looking back, how do you see that EMT Madrid has transformed in last two years? And what are the key learning from that process? Well, for me, uh, I have v uh, an image or a vision or a metaphor I use for, for understanding better this. You know, the Noah's Ark, that the big ship from the Bible where, where Noah brought uh, a couple of, of members of every single 
animal species in, in the in the world just to save them from the deluge uh, and, and, and and we have the uh, that that vision or that uh, image and, and we say always that when did Noah start uh, building the ark hmm. uh, when it was not raining because when it started <laughs> rain the rain you could not build any ark at all you so uh, that's what happened with the pandemic we had to sail with the ships with the tools with the it with the technology and with the innovation we already had in place yeah so for for for, for us the main lesson we could remove cash from our fleet because we were the first uh, uh credit card enabled the whole fleet yes. two years before so we were yes. able to remove the cash because we had ways of uh, of uh, contactless payment in the whole fleet uh we could able uh, to deliver uh occupancy levels uh, in all of our buses uh, because we were for two years testing occupancy sensor and algorithms to see how it was to deliver and we were already launching that mobility as a service trial so our key findings is there is a day when you are called and you are not you have no time to prepare so let's better be prepared every single day amazing in fact during my research i saw one of your presentation and i saw that image so I was, I was I was thinking to ask you about like why that image and now I understood. So so how did you get the clue of be ready before the rain starts? How did you get those clues that you have to be ready uh, before this? Like you mentioned about payment system and all. Uh, you you need uh, uh, the permanent uh, hungry to innovate and yeah. to test everything and to try to deliver the best service ever. For example, we are now uh, trying to think uh, twice or looking at the future of the of our buses, uh, and, and we are trying to see how video analytics and another on the edge technologies and uh, and how to deliver better services and information. Uh, and so we are testing uh, in house what is uh, going on out there and see how new technologies can fit us. So we are like little kids trying to play around with everything <laughs> we see outside. That's a great point you mentioned about. In fact, uh, I have a lot of these questions subsequently, which is about your future project. Now let's talk about uh, one of your key projects, which you mentioned about mobility as a service app in Madrid, which is called Mass Madrid. And, and you were way ahead. You released that app in 2019 itself. So can you tell more about uh, the current feature and the level of this app? And do you feel it's it was successful in meeting its objective? And and if you have any success metrics to share, like uh, because a lot of cities are implementing, so how they can learn from your experience? Uh, we, uh, uh, Madrid Mobility 360, which is the second wave of that mobility as a service initiative, we launched that early in 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 2019. And it was Mass Madrid, Mobility as a Service Madrid. And now we rebranded you to this framework Madrid 360 strategy. So we wanted to, let's say, follow the, the global framework and study from the city because this is a tool for the city. So we rebranded that uh, with Madrid Mobility 360 and we where we put in place uh, the multimodal uh, trip planner, which was a, a key feature from this second wave. Yeah. Uh, and we, we, we already integrated some uh, capabilities to 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 use the application not only for information but to travel in the buses to pay on the on the on the parking lots we have on our parkings and also to use Bithima, the bike sharing scheme here in Madrid. So uh, in this current phase, we 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 launched that and we found how difficult it is to deliver. It's really tough uh, because when you build a, a, a digital system on top of many digital and legacy system, the buses, the bikes, the parkings, and the the the, the identity uh, subsystem, the payment method, the QR engine, and so on and so far, you struggle to to have reliability on the system. So it's been a nightmare. Uh, to deliver on time and on quality uh, yeah. that, that system. And the users, uh, are, they, they are used to uh, Google or the, that same level of quality in their digital experience. So you are investing a tiny 
tiny budget and they are comparing to uh, to <laughs> google maps and say oh this this works not that fine and you say okay can you compare please with my own <laughs> mates not with you know, a, a giant called uh, american silicon valley hero yeah. uh, so how is it going it's going uh, it's been really really difficult uh i i cannot say many more really 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 difficult uh experience uh because you to, to provide reliability and user experience and to enhance the uh, and to bring users to the system you are starting to do to do with a public transport operator which is our team uh to deliver digital service in a very competitive way which is out of your comfort zone yeah you are not good at that. You are good at bringing the buses every day on time on the street. But yeah. trying to be uh, very digital, uh, to be almost a commercial and competing on, in a commercial shape, it is something you are not used to and you have to learn how to do it. So I would say since the, the, the new, this new Madrid Mobility 360 launch, we have learned a lot uh, due to all the mistakes and failures and problems we found. Uh, and, and, and we have learned a lot. And I think at the very end, it was a great initiative to have this Madrid Mobility 360. We, we are investing heavily on having a new wave, a third wave, uh, the, the, our, our third wave of, of this mobility as a service application. Uh, and we expect to have this at the end of this year. Uh, and we have learned a lot. Um, I will take the same Noah's Ark uh, idea that we are testing on real life, on real experience, how this mobility as a service feature and the environment looks like so we can yeah. make up uh, better decisions. And that's where we found th that the principal problem, that the integration problem and other complexities we found all along. That's great. That's great. You rightly mentioned it's not easy and uh, the customer expectation is very high these days. Like even a small glitch, people can make a big noise about that. So meeting that customer expectation is becoming more and more difficult. And, uh, and you rightly mentioned the transit agency focus is to make sure the buses are on time rather than making sure they have best UX design or I would say now you have to take care of both. You have to make sure your buses are on time and you also have to make sure your app look very yeah, good. Yeah, but I have <laughs> 9,000 people working on the buses to be on time and I have 13 people. <laughs> <Working. laughs> yeah, so that's a, <laughs> I don't know who's, uh, who, who can be more efficient, probably the 13 versus 9,000 you are using. <laughs> Well, people are much more satisfied and happy with the buses than with the application right now, but we will, we will improve. That's the spirit. That's what you mentioned. Always stay hungry. You need to be hungry always to innovate and always humble to learn. Never, never shy away saying it's, it's not working or there are some issues, but it's always open to say it's, there is a problem. We will solve it. So as a follow-up to my previous question. In some of the platform, you mentioned that the mass is not for mass market. I'm very curious. Why did you said that? And you also advocated for seven key principles for sustainable mass. You said it must be user centric, which is true. It should be fair and transparent. It should be non-discriminative ecosystem. It should be inclusive. It should be sharing users for users. It should have data sharing and it should offer a safe and sustainable mobility in the last. And you also highlighted that the mask can help to fill a gap in the mobility services that authority hadn't previously noticed and share the concept of governance by design. I mean, these are amazing concepts you mentioned here, uh, stating the real user-centric experience for governance. Please see if you can elaborate further because these all are great points you mentioned and share some key lessons for other cities considering implementing the mask. Yes, uh, this is a good example. Uh, a good example how and when you can learn by doing, and it's very difficult to re uh, to real uh, make decisions uh, from the ivory tower. Uh, so what happened to us? We we are uh, the uh, one of the largest uh, op mobility operator, transport operator here in Madrid, along with Metro, 
Uh, so we've been approached by many mobility as a service platforms to integrate our buses within their applications. So we had that, that side of the coin. And on the other hand, we have uh, our mobility as a service platform, Madrid Mobility 360, uh, uh, where we want to integrate uh, other operators, not only uh, EMT Madrid. So we found ourselves in a place where we have to decide from the operator perspective where to be integrated, in which platforms are we going to say yes? Are we going to integrate with uh, Google, CityMapper, Movid, uh, Wondo, or, or Imbrick, or any other platform? Are we going to be integrated there or not? And if so, what are the principles or the basis to integrate that? And on yeah. the same page as platform, what kind of operators we want to integrate and how are we going to behave uh, with those uh, those operators because here we have some some somehow a deadlock where uh, mobility operators uh, are uh, scared to be integrated through platforms because they don't want to have an intermediary who can uh, lead their customer yeah. away and somehow kidnap uh, the mobility users in a digital space yeah. and bringing them back and forth as we saw before let's say in 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 the in the hotels uh, we had that problems and we learned how strong booking.com can be managing and dealing with the with the hotels owners yeah. so uh, we have that deadlock so the platform they cannot deliver the value because they don't have the operators and the operators don't want to have the platforms on top uh, having the the front desk for the digital users yeah. so that was deadlock so the platform they need but they don't they cannot <laughs> and the operators uh, the other way around so we found ourselves that we need some kind of principle based approach to solve that deadlock yeah. so we, uh, we 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 drafted those seven principles where which we have to stick on them on both sides so I had to write down principle. I had to accept and seems fair for me from the operator viewpoint and also from the platform viewpoint. So that's where we draft those principles. Uh, um, one of the most difficult part was sharing users. So when we integrate uh, in our platform uh, to, to operators, we let the operators to reach the customer in the digital platform. And when we as operator are integrated within a platform, we want to be able to reach the users yeah. through that platform. Uh, and, and, uh, and having any data sharing scheme was also tricky, uh, but we learned that you can uh, arrange some data sharing scheme if you do it on purpose. That is to say, I, as public transport operator, uh, I don't need all the data from a mobility as a service platform, yes. but for me, the origin and destination matrix are crucial. So uh, that is aggregated data. It could be monthly delivered. And that's something that every single platform is willing to share with you because it will help me to better plan my network. Yes. Uh, and it will not damage or hamper their commercial interest from the platform. So uh, sharing users and having data sharing schemes on purpose were two key takes away, takeaways from, from our experience being on both sides of the of the table and that was how we brought those seven principles for sustainable mass because we believe that unless we break that deadlock we will not be able to deliver mobility as a service successfully which is by the way the case globally nobody had delivered a very yeah. successful mobility as a service system nowhere yeah i agree and the second concept you, you brought in the question was government by design. Uh, and and the, the whole question is, or the whole concept we brought in, in government by design is related to this digital nature that winner takes it all. Yeah. The winner takes it all. Uh, so if you are uh, uh, a platform, a digital platform, the first, uh, the first digital provider takes 
the biggest part of the market. It's, it's a very, uh, very strong digital competition. So one, two or three players takes 90% or more of the market. So you are afraid that a free rider puts with amazing user experience or even with some tricky uh, approaches or techniques, they can be the first digital platform for your mobility. Yeah. Uh, we, the other day in Paris, we were in autonomy, the, the, the first. So, uh, and Karen, uh, the secretary general for Police Network, she was saying that nudging uh, users to use e-scooter instead of walking, which is something Google Maps is doing today yeah. is not a nice idea. Uh, if we are going for more sustainable mobility, we need to bring people for more active and sustainable modes, not the yeah. other way around. So a free rider or a, a, let's say a, a player who has other interests, legitimate interests, but different from the public goals, uh, are very difficult to handle if they uh, they get to that preeminent or uh, number one position. And that's the concept where governance by design was all about. So we need to put the pieces in mobility, the digital pieces related to ticketing. We are talking in, in that commission group, uh, we are talking about uh, the ticketing, how we open yeah. tickets for every digital platform so you can easily buy those tickets. Okay, let's open those tickets. But we have to take care that if any single big player uh, at the very end delivers an amazing digital experience in mobility, it's able to be governed uh, right. by the public goals. So we shouldn't put in place um, pieces which have no that digital uh, capabilities of being governed, which is similar or inspired by privacy by design concept, where it is very difficult to build uh, or, the, or to deploy privacy capabilities from legacy system, which were not thought with privacy in mind. That were privacy by the same concept uh, is all yeah. about. So you have to think on privacy from the very, very beginning of the design. So you are able to deliver privacy end to end in your system. And it's very difficult to add a, a tiny layer on top of that to deliver privacy. It should be the same in mobility with governance because this is top number one priority for cities to have proper mobility, sustainable mobility. And we yeah. need to put the places with the appropriate uh, tools, which is governed on top. You, you mentioned, I mean, that's tons of knowledge in last 10 minutes, what you share. And I really like this intense uh, mention, which is kidnapping the customer in the digital space. And, and, and a lot of operators are worried about that. I really like your approach about starting with the principle rather than starting with talking about the technology or APIs and all those kind of stuff, because that can be taken care of. But what is more important is what are the core principle and what public goal you will serve? Like the companies can have their own incentive. You don't mind, like you take care of that but those incentives should align with the public goals. So I really like what you mentioned about these seven principles. And I would say, I haven't heard any other city doing that. So big, big well, congratulations to you. Well, the principle are, I like the, the wheels. Uh, we can invent it several times, but they will be rounded. So, so you, can, <laughs> you, you can have the same principles to every single city and maybe we can have an alliance, a global alliance for sustainable mass and bring, bring those seven principles to life in other shape. For example, I was appointed uh, uh, the president of the Mobility as a Service Commission in the National Association for Public Transport, which is ATUK. Uh, uh, and we made this ex ex uh, the same exercise at national level, and we brought four principles for national agreement. So we now okay. have uh, let's say a national wide uh, principle, which are only four, but the still four is is, is better than nothing, yeah. which, because they frame the, 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 the issue, which is how to align uh, legitimate private commercial interests along with the key goal, goals from the public needs that the mobility has inherited. Yeah, that's, that's, that's amazing. In fact, uh, that's what should be the starting point to work with these players is to align everything towards the public goal rather than 
aligning the technology and uh, other business model. Like a lot of cities are worried about business model, but I feel that will be taken care of if you take care of. No, it will not. It will not. Uh, okay. I, my forecast is that that will not, and that's another question you drop, which is not for the mass market, uh, because it haven't happened anywhere. Yeah. Uh, and we've been here talking about mobility as a service for quite a long time, and nobody had success on 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 bringing business models, uh, sustainable business model there. And and my whole thing is uh, there will not be market uh, here we are talking about intermediary cost so i am a digital layer so i pay i, I get some money for every single ticket i sell yeah but it doesn't seem that selling 1.5 euros tickets which is my single trip ticket in emt madrid will make you rich yes, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, with maybe, all maybe my if respect. I sell, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe if I sell a billion ticket, probably yes. <laughs> but it doesn't look like that. That's uh, yeah. a tremendous. Uh, so uh, having commission on tickets uh, is hardly to say that will be a profitable business. It will be. It could be profitable to have that commission on very expensive trips like taxi or VTC takes Uber or 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 on demand or hailing application. But I think that is not something you want to foster and to deliver globally, which is the first the first option is very expensive options. No, come yeah. on. Uh, so for me, uh, having commission for tickets, for me, does not look like that that's that is going to be very profitable. So we have still two options. One is having some kind of green public or sustainable um, uh, vouchers or credits or whatever you call that. So yeah. uh, you pay for the, the, the carbon footprint you avoid when you have some green credits on top. So it's more related to sustainability at the very end, the public and the very end, uh, some kind of public or shared goals and market and revenues, or we are paying with data, personal data, an influence on that personal data. So the, 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 the crossroad now, if I see that tickets is not the way and commission tickets is whether we are going for more green, sustainable, common cert uh, market, green credits, okay, carbon credits, and so on and so far, or we are going to be a Facebook alike or Google alike or any other data driven platform, which is all about personal data and nudging the consumers to set, to buy what others want to, to sell. And I think that is a risky place where yeah. I will not recommend us to follow. I agree. I think the first option seems quite likely and possible, having those green miles and uh, carbon credit compensation for those, which if you see, Tesla is making money through that. Tesla yeah, is making it's the only... Yeah, it's the only way Tesla is making money is because they are selling uh, carbon uh, car carbon okay. credits. Yeah, uh, but maybe we will we will have a mixture. At the very end, it will not be that pure. Uh, but uh, I see the risk of uh, trying to go after the ticket business model. We I really don't believe it will happen. Uh, and and in the meanwhile, delivering a digital uh, a, a new digital wallet garden for digital big digital players who will at the very end rule if they are not well governed and government by the governance by design, by design is not in place at the very end you will your cities will be ruled by an algorithm designed somewhere else mm. that's a that's a great point to now actually move to the next question which is about ticketing and it's a very hot topic right now in public transportation uh, you rightly mentioned EMT Madrid implemented the EMT pay platform in early 2019 way ahead from other people they are promoting bank card and mobile payment system so this must be very useful during the pandemic. Like you mentioned, you didn't worry about stopping the cash payment because you already have something to fall back. Uh, what are some of the EMT Madrid key initiative in ticketing such as EMV and open loop payment system? And like you mentioned, how do you see the future of single and physical ticket? Like we will see they will disappear and, and who will rule the world in coming days? Well, how we see that uh, uh, having Visa Visa Transit ready back uh, back end developed by EMT and have that technology on board of our fleet and having that 
digital technology over in our backend was amazing useful for very very useful during the, the during the pandemic and it's delivering amazingly well we are very happy to have that uh, on board and by the way we are uh, we are very open to 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 partner and license those technology to third cities and we are talking with a couple of cities to That's deliver great. such technology because one of the points we have seen here is that many times public transport or transport operators we are uh, all the time developing again and again the same technologies uh, uh, each and, uh, and everyone uh, and yeah. that's a very inefficient way to provide that uh, so many times I develop some things in Madrid, uh, my mobility as a service uh, application, platform, multimodal engine, and, and Barcelona does the same, Paris does the same, uh, London, try, they try to do the same, they haven't done that yet, but uh, uh, so we are somehow the, the reinventing and, uh, and investing heavily on new technology which are roughly the same and it would be better to to some more alliance or or, or may pack up uh, our efforts to to get some critical mass to be able to deliver in a better sense or with lower cost and better quality yeah. and that's something we learned from uh, uh, emv uh credit card payments in our buses and we are trying to foster uh, further to other public or private operators in Spain or, or beyond. It's something that we have learned and we are trying to push that, that line, uh, uh, which is something important for us. Uh, and regarding the future of the ticketing, uh, we, we also enable uh, QR codes in our fleet. We, we have installed in more than 1,500 buses. We have roughly 2,100 buses uh, uh, already, but in... Okay. In, in 1,600, 500 plus uh, buses, we have already installed a QR code scanner. So okay. we can read, uh, uh, we can we can read QR codes uh, uh, on board. And we see that as a great opportunity to have easily multimodal or cross-selling public transport tickets. Because if you get to, to, to a long distance station or a, a airport or a train station and you can have printed on your ticket the QR code and you can jump easily yeah. to our bus, it would be seamless. So uh, we see that QR code for those specific or even you 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 enter in the in a in a hotel in the center of Madrid and you get a ticket uh, in your in your car from your uh, when you check in in the hotel so you are able to use your daily ticket or travel ticket or session pass or three days yeah. pass or whatever it would be something very handy to to make easier for the user to move in the train so we we see that uh in the bus or any public transport or any public mean uh, and we see that as an opportunity the qr code to have cross-selling uh those mobility uh capabilities to other segments and the other part we see in the future uh, but it's harder to to forecast or to materialize is uh um, account-based ticketing or similar approaches yeah. uh Mm, that would be something we would like to explore, but it's not that easy and it's more on the PTA, the, the, the consortium hand. We have to see that. But what is for sure uh, clear, crystal clear for me now is that there are no longer mobility operators or new mobility operators on one side and public transport or transit operator on the other side. And we have uh, the elephant in the room is the private car. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we have to have something to help us manage the whole three because yeah. it all will be uh, public transport only, new mobility only. And the public cars is still there and will be there because it makes sense for many people for their daily needs to have yeah. their private car. So we have to merge all together to, to, to make that more efficient. And that's where maybe account-based ticketing or multimodal uh, ticketings or subscription or models could can, help. can help. We will try and when we fail you and we will learn something and we will share here with you <laughs> <laughs> and there with the mobility incubators <laughs> <laughs> no so you you mentioned about uh, the experiment and trying new thing and actually that's my next question emt is one of the 
very few transit agency which are testing blockchain and face recognition technology and launched two pilot in 2019 the first project was the blockchain application for public transport payment in collaboration with banco santander and botan and the second project was the biometric payment for buses with santander mastercard and cefe i would like to know how these projects are progressing and and like you mentioned uh what are your views on blockchain and facial recognition technology in fact uh, we did a podcast on blockchain and mobility and there were a lot of interesting use cases we discovered but i would love to learn from your experience what do you think about these technology and how emt madrid is implementing them uh starting for the face recognition we made the pilot uh and we learn uh, how how to do that and we uh, discontinued the test so okay. we didn't uh, scale it up uh, and I, i would like to share why uh we we, uh, we have several approaches but the first thing we 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 realized and and we are some something uh, thinking that that's a common ground or or a safe ground for us is we don't want uh, personal video face uh, images or streams to be uh, broadcast out of the bus so okay. what we first have thought is uh, every single thing we are going to explore or try we don't want to build a new uh, a uh, uh, big brother or alike so mm-hmm. all the processing should be on board uh, that's something w- w- that we are really thinking on so that's why we are testing some edge computing capabilities mm-hmm. uh, because we really think that we should avoid having all this we are installing six cameras yeah. in in every single bus think about having all those cameras stream to a central uh, place or you you can really uh, follow up uh, everyone in the city to make a big brother so that's the first question we didn't like was uh, uh to stream video out of the or, or images or personal images there and the second one was uh it's a nice feature for those who like and and enjoy because the main the main feature of face recognition is could be it could you can have an account based ticketing yeah. or purchase tickets we have having anything with you you can be you know, on the beach we don't have beach in madrid okay. <laughs> but <laughs> think about that you have a beach uh, and you're in your swimming clothes uh with nothing uh in your pockets and you can travel easily yeah. In, in in the bus that's something amazing and and you will enjoy that uh but and you can be very happy but at the same time i have to place a camera pointing at the face of 99% of the users which are not going to use that feature yeah so it has externalities negative externalities such as system uh, which can be uh, reduced in the speed of the onboarding because you have to let's think about okay you put it aside and you open something so it see you and so it will slow down the check in or 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 or, or the um, the boarding uh, in the bus or it will affect uh, uh, in a negative way to other users which will say oh there's a camera there looking at my face and they are processing my face to see if i am on their database i don't like that so it has externalities we didn't see that they are uh, uh, that, that the advantages are strong enough to pay off those ex- negative externalities yeah. so it's all about pr- proportionality uh, if you think about uh, fa- face recognition is um, an amazing technology but has a lot of negative externalities and risk and you have to handle with proportionality uh, and what we have found is that we don't see right now uh, face recognition proportional to pay 1.5 euros hmm. And at the very end, even if you go to the beach, come on, you will take your mobile <laughs> phone with you, or or you aren't you? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you will. <laughs> Nobody is, is is going away without uh, it's a smartphone. Yeah. Uh, so bring your smartphone and pay with that. And, and so we didn't see that as a, as a as a as a way forward because of those reflections. I am certain. Uh, and the second was blockchain uh we we have tried uh several approaches for blockchain applications uh you know blockchain is a technology 
which is better used in um, uh, places where you cannot trust everyone. It's a, yeah. it's, it's a tool to enhance trustworthy in, uh, in low trust systems. If I don't really trust someone, maybe we can use a blockchain to have clear, clear uh, transparency of the transactions and the obligations of the parts if we don't see it. So it, it brings up, uh, it adds uh, trust on the, on the system uh, with a given cost, which is processing and technology. Uh, and we have tried that for, for, for payments and, and we don't see a higher value compared to credit card or, or tra travel, uh, transit card or cash. So they are not that common. Uh, it, it requires uh, very uh, high-end and costly technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's for the very, very happy few. Uh, so we don't see that for payments uh, compared to any digital platform payments or any credit card payments or ca cash or or or, or transit uh, cards, yeah. which are very uh, they, they are very well uh, they have a a, a, a huge uh, customer base. So we don't see specifically blockchain for payments now. Just to share. Uh, uh, our reflection and we have also yeah. tried blockchains for identity okay uh, sovereign identity blockchain is something we have already uh, explored but digital sovereign identity uh, with blockchain is to say because I know you have listeners in mobility innovator which are top of the list in technology, but I will try to, to think that maybe one or two are not that aware of digital, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> digital yeah, yeah. trends. <laughs> so for those two or three who uh, they don't understand that much, the technology, uh, sovereign identity with blockchain means that I, Juan, have my identity in a, in a given space in the blockchain, and I can share my, my personal information to other players in that yeah. sphere, which is, this is me, this is my phone number, this is my email or any other record I have in my identity. So they can use that for a given access or, or a given purpose. And I can remove the, the, that information on my will, not on your will. That is to mm. say, I give you my email to, to, to log in into any event you are promoting. Okay, I give you my email, you put there. And when I want, I can assist a sovereign identity, remove that information to, from your system and you are not able to retain that information. Yeah. Okay, that's good when you want to be identified or deal with people you don't trust that much. Uh, but for me, as a public transport operator or a mobility as a service platform, I don't feel uh, if a user wants to delete their account or cancel their account, they can cancel. But I cannot have this, uh, now I give you my number, now I remove you the number. <laughs> uh, so, so we couldn't find a place where having data by data sovereignty is better to remove the account. Interesting. So, so if you want to log in, log in. If, want, if you want to cancel, cancel, but don't mess me up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that's, a, that's a right approach. And I, I love the approach which you mentioned is to experiment everything. But at the end of the day, you need to compare the benefit with the external factor and the cost involved. And if the benefit is not uh, overweight or, or you know, uh, cover those cost and those uh, negative factor, make no sense to go towards that. But at the same time, experiment, explore uh, more, these. Uh, yeah, just to, to be a bit more positive, I, uh, we like uh, and, and enjoy testing blockchain uh, application. I see blockchain a, a strong uh, uh, place or, or a very green field to play with in this new mobility scenario. Yeah. When you have the cars and you have new mobility operators and you have carbon credits and you have public transport there with so many players, small, big, private, public, uh, individual and commercial, maybe there we, we could find that Some the way to pay the green credits and the benefits could be in a blockchain where you can deliver that on, on a trusty, trusted way. 
maybe there I will see that, but it's not today. <laughs> No, but you mentioned the great point. Actually, we cover these use cases in our, our conversation on blockchain uh, about these green miles and uh, creating a common platform for new mobility player and all, not for ticketing, because we see it's not worth to, like you said, 1.5 euro ticket. And do you really need that much of technology or it can be solved by credit card, debit card, which is already there, secure and can manage use it for something which is more important and more uh, require more complex critical. solution, more critical. No, that's great. Uh, so you, you rightly mentioned about that and love that. Now I want to cover about you, which you mentioned earlier that uh, EMT Madrid currently operate one of the la Europe's largest fleet of electric buses. Uh, you invested more than hundred, some hundred million <laughs> euro you mentioned, <laughs> and uh, you now have more than 200 buses in the fleet. And the goal is to have 25% of the fleet fully electric by 2025. You know, what I see that these electric buses are very, uh, are fully connected vehicle and provide lots of data. At the same time, they require more planning in terms of charging, range management, status of charge and all. So I have two questions for you. One is, will these electric buses will be managed by the new IT system or you are modifying your existing IT infrastructure? And secondly, I also noticed that EMT Madrid is procuring buses from different manufacturers. Like you have buses from BYD, you have buses from Irizar and other players as well. Do you see any challenge in integrating these buses with the EMT backend system? What kind of a measure you are taking to ensure standardization? Because if you have multiple operator or multiple manufacturer, how you make sure they are integrating well as a fleet? Not easy. <laughs> <laughs> it is, I can imagine. <laughs> it, it, it is not easy. Yeah. Uh, bringing things uh, 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 by parts. Uh, what is more difficult for us, and we are not ready there to, to deliver, and we are really testing and trying to innovate there, is all the uh, technology you need to deliver uh, the charging for the electrical fleet in a, in a huge depots we have. We have depots with 200, 300, 400 buses, which is not the, 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 the most common case. Other, yeah. other operators rely on a smaller a smaller depots, but we, 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 we think that it's more efficient, or at least for us, it's more efficient to deliver from, from five or six big depots with hundreds of buses there. So having a smart charging capabilities um, for having the whole fleet ready to deliver the miles they have or the kilometers they have to deliver on a daily basis is integrating your planning system to your charging system and, uh, and moving all that around because the charging is slower than going for, for gas or petrol. So uh, that is new and we have to test how to do that. And we will need people, uh, very talented people from the electricity and the smart grid and uh, uh, smart charging technologies to deliver something which is viable and we don't have in at hand and we don't have that top talent to deliver and and we are really see to we are inv we are investing more than 100 million euros in a depot electrical full electrical depot and with a, a smart charging to be one of the our top priorities uh that will be the first and the second challenge we have smart charging and how to make the planning and the charging ready and the second will be the compatibility between the chargers and the buses yeah uh, we saw that in the in the in the laptops. We saw that in the smartphones. So uh, having different cables and charger for every single phone you buy is a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> so we will have to push for chargers which are able to deliver electricity to every single type of bus, and it's something which is not ready in place. And we are struggling to have the manufacturer of those chargers on board. Uh, they are not there. They are willing to sell you a specific charger for specific buses to have you uh, in that wallet card. And, uh, and that is difficult, uh, yeah. I, I would say. Uh, regarding the other IT, the, the, the credit card uh, or the console for the buses, the ticket system, on, on, on. as we put install that on top of the bus, 
uh, uh, we don't feel that that will be a great problem because we are delivering the same experience with uh, the, the several types of buses we have now with diesel, which are no longer this year is the last year we will have uh, any diesel in the fleet, gas or electricity or hydrogen we are bringing on top. We will put all those add-ins add uh, with IT and they will deliver the same credit card, QR, cameras and everything ready. So we are not worried about that. But the other part you mentioned is the, all the telemetrics, uh, yeah. all the telemetry and, and, the, and that information from the bus uh to 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 have a connected bus and that's a challenge that's something challenging and we see the two main trends we see that uh manufacturers as are looking at those digital capabilities part of the revenue model in the future so uh -huh. they want you to pay for a license or subscription or uh, revenue uh, to be paid uh, along with the bus for years to have those over the air uh, updates or so. Uh, so they are willing to, to uh, as I am BYD or Mercedes or Castro Sua or Elisa or any other manufacturer, I want you to be locked in my system and the manufacturers are willing to go with that way. So the only way you can install uh, telemetrics is with my system and the software is my system. So I, I see that trend coming. Uh, and the other way around is how we are able to isolate the, the layers. So you have the connected vehicle with some capabilities to be connected with several telemetrics or uh, IOTs and then deliver to a software layer which can manage somehow that information to be useful for the public transport, but also for the manufacturer, because I'm fine uh, with the manufacturer to look after their buses to reduce maintaining costs. That is fine for me. I have no problem. But we will have to, to go again for, for that standardization or at least isolation, at least uh, remove the, the grids or the wallet garden they are willing you to stay. So it's a, it's a, it's not like you mentioned, it's not an easy task to handle and, <laughs> and nobody has answer to it uh, oh, because yes. there are vested interest. Uh, and I, I would say like these manufacturers have their own priority. They want to have control over their data. So they are not uh, ready to share that, but yeah, you rightly mentioned the issuing with the charging infrastructure, which is not standardized. The issue with telematics in the buses, which is still not standardized. And the cities are facing another challenge of just implementing new buses or bring inducting new buses in the fleet. So many of people don't get time to even think about these issues. They are just procuring and they, they're not even thinking about it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, but the most advanced uh, surely are listening to your podcast, and maybe we can help sharing at least our vision. <laughs> <laughs> That's the idea. That's the idea. And also now uh, about my next question, I want to ask you your thoughts on on-demand transit and uh, demand responsive buses. Many cities around the world are introducing these flexible service in addition to the fixed line to provide service in low density area, late night trips, covering some of the trout they can serve with the larger buses. Uh, so EMT Madrid also launched on-demand service Smart Bus Madrid in July, 2020. Can you, sure, can you share more about this project? And uh, do you really think that the on-demand buses is the future and they can com complement to the main services? Uh, and, and if yes, what are your plans for the expansion? Well, we made that that pilot for six months in 2020 during the heavy pandemic uh, to isolate uh, people going back and forth to the hospital so they can be safer uh, with uh, trace uh, contact trace in place uh, with less uh, less kilometers in the in the in the main in the in the main lines and and able to deliver faster and safer trips for for people going for people going back and forth to the hospitals uh so that was the intention of that pilot and we learned how to do that and we we saw the limitation on, on how to operate such a system uh and we learned a lot so last uh 
December, we launch um, uh, a tender to procure the technology needed to 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 roll out that system uh, on, on on a scale. So we are now ending that procurement process, yeah. and, and before summer, we will have uh, a smart a regular smart bus zone in the north of Madrid, pro probably uh, running. Uh, so we learned. Uh, how to do that, and we are going to to deliver such a, a service in Madrid uh, as not as a pilot, but as a permanent zone at least for the for the next couple of years and see how it goes. What are what is our vision like regarding uh, regarding the the on demand uh, transit or demand bus? Uh, I also use another image, which is the microwave. Uh, I see uh, the on-demand uh, bus is a microwave. I don't know uh, if everyone will remember, but in the, in the late 70s or 80s, the microwave was, uh, was launched on a large scale and many advertisements were saying, you will not need an oven, you will not, be a, <laughs> you will not need a fire because the microwave will solve everything and with this tiny and amazing uh, uh, um, uh, feature, you will be able to have a smarter and funnier and better kitchen all along yeah. okay they they over promised uh, they over promised and they didn't deliver okay that's yeah. true okay the, that that didn't happen i have my oven i have my fire and but at the very end every every one of us we all have a microwave yes so it didn't change everything in your kitchen but it delivered enough value to remain and to stay and that's where we see the on-demand bus. They will deliver the value in a certain place, maybe for heating milk or... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not complaining. I, no, it's fine for me. <laughs> uh, so uh, we will find a place or a, a heating need where on-demand buses will, will, will deliver the value. Uh, with those low density uh, or large areas uh, or yeah. low low surf areas, which uh, standard regular lines are not being able to deliver. So we we have bought our microwave, and, and we will invite you. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, this this is one of the best analogy I ever heard, and uh, in fact, I'm just thinking like my wife bought a, one of the costliest microwave. Because she said she promised me that she will bake cake someday and she will do wonderful thing, and it never happened. So <laughs> I, I used to blame her, you know, for spending money. So I wish uh, transit agencies will find the microwave which suits their requirement and and tip <laughs> and pay, <laughs> and use it. <laughs> now it's a best uh, best analogy, and you rightly mentioned there will be scope for having these micro transit or microwaves in the in the in the transit agencies but uh, how to use it optimally and how much you should spend money like if you are not looking to expand too much so you should have a minimal technology if you are really looking to expand this service then you should go really deep into that yeah that that's why we we have procured that and and we will roll it out and and and, and see how it goes Probably, probably connect with you in the next uh, couple of years again to learn more about your experience. Now, I can keep chatting with you for hours and hours, like I'm enjoying so much, but I promise this is my last question. And it's about startups and innovation. And uh, EMT Madrid is a key partner of Madrid in Motion, a city of Madrid initiative to engage startup in mobility. And currently you have posted a challenge on how can advertising on board buses be improved so that users receive targeted and relevant message. I'm very curious. Uh, can you share a little more about the challenge and how do you believe startup can assist transit agencies in addressing some of these most pressing issue? You, you mentioned some of them in the conversation, but there are many other issues. How can startup help transit agencies? In that specific, uh, in, the, in that specific uh, challenge, we launched. Uh, uh, thank you to uh, Madrid in Motion and the, the innovation hub for mobility we have here in Madrid. Um, uh, I have to explain why. Uh, advertisement is the third 
income line on our budget. Mm. Uh, so having digital advertisement, which can improve the, the profit of those spaces and having less hassle of um, installing all the uh, vinyl in, in the buses could be very good for us, even though only reducing costs and keeping the, in, uh, the income will be amazing for us. That's why we, yeah. we, we launched that challenge, how to digitalize and how to figure out how to do that. Uh, so we launched that uh, challenge we got a winner for that challenge and we had to spend six months thinking on the future of the bus uh, and how we can deliver uh, uh, that um, advertising experience and how to how to make it. Uh, and I cannot tell much more because something, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 but we found that certain uh, regulatory requirements uh, can stop or uh, inhibit uh, delivering such innovation on the fleet. But we are going to do several tests and pilots to move a bit forward on that uh, scenario uh, because we have a final uh, reflection. I it was re reading the other day uh, uh, an article for, 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 a, for a, a magazine, um, a, a digital magazine uh, quite important in Spain. And I was explaining all about the cameras we have, the electronics we have on board, the sensors, uh, the payment, the QR, the, the D, uh, and now the DRT the, the on demand and how little the users uh, yeah. are aware of this technology. And maybe I, uh, I, I am the IT guy, okay? Uh, Chief Technology and Innovation Officer here. Uh, uh, sometimes we want to be good referees in, in, the, in, in, the, soccer, in, the, in the soccer field. So we want to, to be invisible. Uh, but maybe we went too far uh, because people, they don't realize how much technology and innovation we are delivering to the transit. Uh, and we should maybe try to, to, to bring back some sign and bright and wow effect to the transit. Uh, and that's something I want all the innovators out there to help us make, uh, make the transit uh, great again, make the transit wow again, make the transit modern and, and um, fancy uh, yeah. again. We, we, have, uh, we are let, less sexy than we need to be, to be yeah. <laughs> the backbone <laughs> of the mobility in the future. That's very true. And you rightly mentioned that uh, we are investing, we are doing so much, but sometimes it's like a referee, which is invisible, who's controlling the whole match, but it's invisible. And, and you greatly mentioned about that advertising revenue, which is third largest. In fact, uh, one of the guy, he mentioned to me that uh, average users spend 10 minutes on Facebook and Facebook advertising revenues is like hundreds of billion dollars. And we spend 120 minutes at least in the transit network average user, you know, you take a trip for and thought. So how can we monetize that 120 minute when people are in, in the, in the transit, but yeah, that's a great point. You mentioned about bringing those innovation and bringing forward that, like I said, we had such an interesting conversation about technology, mobility, public transit. I really love it. But to end this our podcast, there is a round of a rapid fire question round. And in which I'll ask you five. You said questions. the other one was the last one. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was like the formal one. Now we are talking about you, and uh, this this rapid fire question round is basically five question. I ask you and just want some quick response from your side. And if you're ready, I'll ask my first question. Yeah, I'm not very good at quick answers, but I'm fine. <laughs> I love uh, you are, you are, uh, I would say a most experienced debate person I ever met. So if you were not in telecommunication or transit sector, what other profession you would have selected? Lawyer. Lawyer. I can, I can see that. <laughs> You're so good in putting forward the argument analogies and all. So I can imagine that. And any particular reason? Uh, I like abstract uh, construct with make us as a society uh, happier that's a great point great service you have traveled around the world which is your favorite city in the world uh, my hometown santander i am uh, a conservative <laughs> 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 my things my people my place <laughs> not very innovative in that sense 
Okay, so now this is a tough question for you. Which city has the best transit network in the world? Uh, uh, the disclaimer comes first. I am I work for a transit <laughs> agency, <laughs> so everything I say afterwards is compromised somehow. So I would say Madrid. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I, to be honest, I take it because it is one of the good system in the world. I love what the uh, Madrid uh, transportation system is doing. Uh, your favorite startup in the mobility sector? Wow. Uh, I like many of them. Uh, I, I would say those dealing with autonomous uh, vehicle and, and self-driving vehicles are my top list, but they haven't delivered yet. So yeah. I would prefer not to pick up one, but they are doing amazing things. Uh, and we expect very good things in the, in the near future there. I would expect not to have a big brother from the private sector, which would be even worse <laughs> than the public <laughs> one. But uh, let's see. But I, I would say one of the autonomous vehicles, we have one very nice here, which is Gogo, doing amazing things here in Madrid. But there are many there. Autonomous vehicles would be my top of the list. Top list. I love them because, uh, I mean, they are, like you rightly mentioned, they are not yet uh, proven, but uh, what they are developing can be a game changer in the future and my last question is if you could change one thing about your life what would it be oh come on <laughs> <laughs> i wish i have not such a power otherwise i would be regretting the whole thing <laughs> i i am happy to be a humble human <laughs> human <laughs> That's great, you know, and that's uh, I can see even in our conversation that humility and uh, eagerness to learn and eagerness to experiment and that come from the great leader. So thank you so much, Juan, for your insightful comment. As always, I really enjoyed this conversation and learn a lot from your experience. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for well, inviting me. <laughs> thank you for listening to this podcast. We'll be inviting some other inspiring guests in the coming week. You can subscribe to this podcast online to get the notification for the next episode. If you like this podcast, please don't forget to give us a five-star rating as it will help us to spread our message. If you have any feedback or suggestion for this podcast, please do write to us at info at the rate mobility-innovator.com. Look forward to see you next time. 